Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This afternoon's webinar topic is Sustainable Employment and Economic Development, Economic Empowerment for Our Native Communities. This webinar is sponsored by ANA and hosted by the Eastern Region Training and Technical Assistance Center. You can see our web address down at the bottom of this slide. We are a resource of the Administration for Native Americans, um, and we provide training and technical assistance to both ANA applicants as well as ANA grantees. My name is Rondell Clay. I am a woman of the Dakota Nation and a member of the Sistinwapton Oyate. I have been a TA provider for the Administration for Native Americans for over 14 years. My primary background is in elementary education and early childhood education. Um, and I guess that just about sums me up. I would like to turn this over at this point to our first presenter. Mia, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Rondell. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is, as Rondell said, Mia Strickland, and I am the director for the Division of Program Operations at the Administration for Native Americans. Thank you for joining us today for our presentation on sustainable employment and economic development strategies. We affectionately call this program SEEDS at ANA. Um, and today our goal for this webinar is to provide all attendees with an overview and an insight onto our SEEDS initiative. I will present an overview of the initiative, including its purpose and some award information. And we're also going to get a chance to hear from one of our SEEDS grantees. Again, my name is Mia Strickland, and I am a member of the Lumbee Tribe. I've been with ANA for the past two and a half years as the DPO Director or the Division of Program Operations. And it's my pleasure to work with program specialists as well as our grantees to award and implement ANA projects in Native communities. Throughout my 15 years in the federal government, either working on Capitol Hill, with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, as well as the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, I've been able to serve as an advocate for Native people in terms of helping others understand how their programs and the policies will affect Native communities. I've also had the pleasure of working for the American Indian Higher Education Consortium to advocate for tribal colleges and universities, and I did that for about six years. Okay. Our SEEDS project is, as I stated, um, Sustainable Employment and Economic Development Strategies. This funding opportunity announcement um, will allow for up to five years of a project period. We did this knowing that it sometimes takes five years to for business to generate revenue and to be self-sustaining. So we wanted to be able to show um, that we're able to make a difference and an impact in Native communities on the front of increasing jobs as well as starting businesses in Native communities. In order to do that, we wanted to maximize the funding level, so we did increase the ceiling so applicants can request up to $500,000 a year for five years. Um, and because of our authorizing legislation, the Native American Programs Act, there is a 20% applicant match, which can be cash or in kind. And the other stipulation I need to let you know is that uh, because this program has the same CFDA number, which is 93.612, um, and ANA has a policy that no grantee can have more than one award per CFDA number. Um, therefore, you cannot have a SEDS or a SEEDS grant at the same time. Our SEDS is our sustain, um, social and economic development strategies. Um, and then there's SEEDS. So 
they have the same CFDA number, and so therefore you cannot have uh, a grant for each of those programs at the same time. Uh, the priority areas for seeds include that we want to be able to create jobs. Um, our commissioner, Lillian Sparks Robinson, started the SEEDS initiative a couple of years ago as, as the country was really um, still in the throes of uh, a recession and we knew it was heavily impacting Native communities, probably more so than the rest of the United States. So she really wanted to um, invest in an effort to create jobs and employment opportunities for Native peoples. So that's why our priority areas for this FOA, this funding opportunity announcement, is to create jobs, to create or expand businesses, to increase revenues that are generated, um, as well as to increase the number of Native Americans that are actually employed, um, as and finally, to keep the jobs and the revenues in the community so that um, folks from outside aren't necessarily coming in to take these jobs. We want to have homegrown jobs, and we want the f revenues, hopefully, to be recycled within the community. And that's uh, what sets us apart from C SEDS. So, so far, we've had two cycles of funding. We started this initiative, like I said, in FY 2013, where we were able to fund 14 SEEDS grantees. And this year, we funded 15 grantees. So we currently have 29 SEEDS grantees. Some of the types of projects that we have funded include, um, like I said, employment and job development. Um, and those can be training opportunities as well as uh, green job development. Um, I believe we've got some projects uh, using wind turbines and solar energy. We have uh, several projects that are doing employment and job skills development, such as uh, construction, um, entrepreneurship development, and again, that those are some are incubators to really hone in and, and train selected individuals who have concepts and ideas on how to develop businesses. We do small business development as well as agribusiness development. Um, we've funded several projects to establish farmers markets or even vineyards uh, to create economic development in those some communities. Cottage industry development. Uh, and tourism programs as well. And you can read all about our projects for the SEEDS uh, initiative on our website. We have them all listed there. Um, again, I want to really emphasize the distinction between SEEDS and SEDS. Um, the SEDS program really has a lot broader priority areas that we can fund. Um, you can read those in the actual FOAs, which you can also find on our website. So it has a, m a much more broader range of uh, activities that you can do under SEDS, where SEEDS has very specific um, outcomes that we want to achieve at the end of the project period. And those five things are listed there. The um, applicant must fill or fulfill the first two of those five objectives, and then the other three of other three objectives are optional, and they state that in the application on which of the ones they want to um, that they will be tracking throughout their project. And the reason we're doing this is because we really want to be able to demonstrate at the end of the our investment with this initiative that we were able to produce jobs, we were able to generate revenue, we, and the kinds of jobs that we created and the, the people that we employed were Native Americans, how much revenue was generated, did this revenue stay on the reservation. So um, these things are really important for us to 
established right up front as the applicant prepare their um, project strategy and how they were going to be able to achieve and track these things throughout their project period. In addition, um, unlike SEDS, for the SEEDS program, we are going to, we being ANA, will have a federally sponsored evaluation strategy. So therefore, no project funds can be used um, for self-evaluation or, or, or paying for an evaluator. Um, we will um, be doing the evaluation for these projects. And also the thing that sets up these projects apart is that we really want them to be shovel ready. We want them to be able to hit the ground running um, so that they have the greatest uh, opportunity um, for success right at the beginning. Um, in our SEEDS FOA, uh, as well as on our on the HHS Grants Forecast website, you'll find that we have, we plan for the FY 2015 competition. Um, we've set aside $4.75 million for, the, for new awards for this project. We hope to be able to fund at least 15 projects. Of course, that varies depending on the amounts requested. Um, and we do anticipate publishing this FOA by December 4th. That's just in a couple of weeks. We also want to allow maximum opportunity for applicants to respond. So this announcement will be posted for 90 days with a closing date of March the 4th, 2015. So that will allow you to work on this application even throughout the holidays. And then we will um, do our own panel review, internal review, and make our funding decisions uh, and announce the new awardees by September 30th, 2015. Thank you, Mia. Now we're going to go on and, and uh, move on to our next presenter. Our next presenter is the business man manager. Uh, for the Passamaquoddy Development um, Projects. She is a member of the Passamaquoddy Indian Township Tribe. She was the Indian Township Housing Director for seven years. Um, she is now, as I mentioned, the manager of the Passamaquoddy Maple Syrup Project and she's been in that position for 11 months. She's the mother of four, the grandmother of 10. And she attended three years at the University of Maine um, in the business field and had to leave to take care of her mother. So she is a very family-oriented um, person and I do know that her workers happen to call her mama there. So I will turn it over to Marie. And she's laughing at me right now. I know she is. Okay, Mama Bear, take it away. Yes, hi. I'm Marie Harnois. And um, as Rondell had said, I have been the manager the, for the Passacoy Maple Syrup Benches for 11 months. We... Um, we're awarded a SEDS grant for 499422 with a match of 128750 We have been um, hit the ground running as soon as we were able to. It was, this SEEDS project is an awesome opportunity for my tribe to be able to create a sustainable business in the maple syrup industry. Our tribe owns thousands of acres in western Maine. They were purchased in the early 80s. And up until this part, all have been used for is logging and hunting. When the land was purchased, it was originally purchased in vast tracts of clear cuts. And at the time that the purchase happened, these were clear cuts. And the only thing that was really left behind on sections of this land was the young maple. So here we are, 
over 30 years later with an opportunity to become one of the largest maple syrup producers in North America with the land that we have as these maple trees have matured and are ready to um, start producing. We have, um, we have created five seasonal positions, one full-time position. We are also um, expanding into value added so that we will eventually come out with our own private label. So hopefully soon you will see our products on your shelves or order online. The five seasonal workers, um, all except for one, travel from one of two reservations to work here. We are four hours away from our home reservation. So we have had um, a lot of interest in people coming up to work. It's in the mountains of western Maine, so it is quite beautiful for everybody. The slide that you're seeing here is the new section that we have just completed, which will hold 6,500 taps. This area is what we call, a, what they call light harvest. Some thinning was done to it to take down the dead trees, um, thin it out a little so our lines can go in. Each one of these lines is run by hand, and it takes a crew of four to be able to pull these lines through and to attach them all. We had some training. Um, we had a professional maple syrup line installer come in and train us on how to run these lines as we are using the best practice. So it was a learning experience for all of us. We did have a delay in when we started this project. Um, the government had shut down, so the grant wasn't, even though it was awarded, wasn't available until, I do believe it was in November somewhere. And by the time we got everything together, we started working on this in December. Um, when we started working on this project, what they call a polar vortex had moved in, so we were working in the extreme cold just to be able to get this going and get this started. And we did manage to get in 3,000 taps. Uh, we had a lot of trial and error. It, like I said, it was a learning experience for all of us. Um, we learned to work outside. Um, sometimes in very adverse weather conditions. But all in all, um, we did it. We felt proud of ourselves. We, after the professional line installer left, we continued working. And we made mistakes, and we realized, and we were able to correct them. And I was glad we were able to learn the first season on 3,000 taps, as this year we plan on 20,000 taps. The slide that you're looking at now is our very first section. You're actually seeing every piece of line that goes in there. The black lines are the vacuum lines. The, the larger green one on the bottom is actually the sap line. These will run directly into a sap house. And a vacuum system is hooked up to it to help keep the flow of sap going. The small lines that you see attached to the trees are the loops are what we call drop lines. And the loops are drops. When we're ready to tap, those loops um, will be taken, taken down. These trees are all hand tapped, and they're connected to the system. And the entire time that this is happening, a vacuum pump is running. And um, there's a whole technique to the way this needs to be done, because not only do we rely on the vacuum line, but we also rely on natural gravity, as we do not want to put too much pressure on our trees for the health and the safety of our trees. We want to keep the trees as healthy as we can. Um, our employees, you know, have, some of the employees have told me that they really didn't know when these advertisements went out. They knew it was in Western Maine. Most of them have been to Western Maine for hunting, fishing, um, or camping. But to be able to live here, um, it was interesting. We had one young fellow that just graduated high school. It was his first real job away from home, so it was a learning experience. We were able to rent an apartment for him, but I also had to help them learn how to shop for themselves, make sure they had what they needed. Um, so they do call me Mama Bear on, on those things. So not just about giving them a job and sending them out in the woods and teaching them a trade. For one and for actually for two of them. You know, I was worked with them on making sure that they knew that, yes, when they got their paycheck, 
they didn't run down to the local stores and spend it all. You know, you needed to have things here. You needed to make sure you knew to have your laundry detergent. So we did a lot of life um, lessons with them. And it's really worked out well. And, and to see one that started have his own checking account and be able to manage it and to make sure he has what he needs after this time, um, you know, I feel proud because I see him doing it. And he feels proud because he's standing on his own two feet now. Um, there are long hours out there, and they you either enjoy being outside in the weather, or you're not going to last, but the crew I have, they enjoy it, every one of them. And we do get together um, at least once or twice a week, because we are off the reservation, and it is one of the things I think that help us as a people, we do get together, we do have our dinners together, we do have... Um, cookouts together, just, you know, because it reminds us of home. So we bring part of that with us while we're up here working. And it's too far for most of them to be able to afford to travel back and forth every week. So they do stay up here for a month at a time and go back, you know, at least once a month. The next slide you have here is uh, a picture of a tap home. And one of the reasons why this is so important is we are organic certified. And like I said, we need to take care of the health of our trees. So we have a specific way that our trees are tapped. And that hole, um, from that hole over, we'll be moving 6 inches over, 12 inches up or down. If we vary from the formula that we have established, we could lose our organic certification. So we, like I said, we spent a lot of time training and working with the organic people to make sure that we were our standards we're going to meet those. Um, we've had a lot of challenges. We were all new to this. Um, the last time I ever worked in a maple stand, it was still carrying buckets. So I don't have to say how old I am. <laughs> but um, a lot of us really didn't know what to expect. So we got out there. We listened to the professional's um, trainer. When he left, we picked up and we figured it out as we went. Um, the weather up in Western Maine is always a challenge. It snows early, it gets colder early, um, but it is beautiful. And the distance from the home reservations for the workers. You know, they do get homesick, but um, they enjoy it up there. It's a beautiful country. And housing. Our sugar house is located nine miles off of Tar Road. There's no phones, electricity, cell phones, internet. Um, as for the younger ones, when they're out there, sometimes that's a little bit hard for them to get used to, is that isolation. But I think hopefully we're going to be working on that. Um, the employees have been able to retain the original ones that we originally hired and picked up two new ones. And we only have a three-year grant instead of a five-year grant. The SEEDS grant has helped us establish our infrastructure. Um, the training we need, the equipment we need, but it's starting a brand new business. And with only three years of funding, you know, we really have to push hard to get where we need to be to be able to stand on our own feet so that we're not depending on the tribe or any outside sources, that we will make enough in our own revenue to be able to continue this um, business. So my crew understands that, and they're willing to put the hours in to make this succeed. Um, the picture you're seeing here is, is an up-close um, picture of all the ties that happen. These are all intricate, tied into each other. Um, there's a lot of pieces that um, we have to learn to be able to make these connections and build this infrastructure. And this is, I do believe, a section of our new, no, it's our original section. I see a drop there. So we had a lot of training. We had training, and then we had to learn a lot on our own. Now, we've also had um, a lot of success in reaching out and attracting additional funders. We recently were awarded a 99,000 USDA value added grant that will help 
um, kicked off the bottle in section so that we will have a private label. And we were also able to attract a 250000 Northern Border Commission grant from the state of Maine to help with the construction of our sugar house. Um, as to date, we've been using, we converted our steel container into a temporary sugar house. And we use that our first year. And hopefully by our second year, our sugar house will be up so that we will be able to um, cook our own syrup. So this project has a lot of promises, has a lot of potential, and has attracted additional funding um, from the state of Maine, from the USDA, and also from the forestry. We've created a strong working um, bond with the forestry, and we work hand in hand as this is a forest product, and they do help us manage it. So it has a lot of potential and a lot of um, working parts that Sometimes are hard to balance, but we manage. <laughs> we work with Chris Rum, who is the grant writer on the project, and also the grant writer for um, the USDA and the Northern Border Commission grant. And our consultant is Perry Gates, who at one point had owned Maine Gold and recently retired. So he has been in the maple syrup industry for 20-something years. and ran a very successful business and now is on as our consultant to mostly work with our value added to get our product going. Um, forestry has cleared 150 acres for us and they were able to secure funding for 100 acres of it through their timber stand improvement program. So that didn't cost us anything and it was um, a leveraged resource that we were able to use. It's not a match as it's a federal funding source but it is a leveraged resource. Um, right now, we're working on getting additional funding for our sugar house. Our sugar house, um, due to location and the weather and the timing of all grants, unfortunately, always fall after October when it's getting cold here. will cost us more money to build, so I'm hoping um, that we're able to attract additional funding so that we will be able to get the sugar house up and to the, to the position that we need it in to be able to run a successful year. Um, um, that's an outside picture of our um, container that we converted into a makeshift sugar house. It served its purpose, um, but offered very little um, comfort in the, as in warmth or anything. So we really need our own sugar house. But with the seeds, with the seeds grant, we were able to start this business without going to an outside investor and giving away. Um, a portion of our business. We own the land, we own the trees, and with the seeds grant we are going to have our own equipment so that when this is going it is going to be a completely tribal owned business. And that is one of the most important things um, to me personally that we're building this business for our tribe. We're on our year two. Um, I think we had a successful year one. But we're continuing to install our tap lines. Um, the one area that we I find we fall a little short is work is um, funding for workers. Um, we're installing infrastructure, and we never have enough time. So that's something we'll look at it for year three. But we are working. You know, we keep working and doing what we can. And to increase our sales, like I said, if we can get our sugar house up and running and our evaporator in place, then we'll be able to cook our own syrup and we won't be selling our raw product. So selling our raw product and cooking our own syrup will actually double our program income. Yeah, one of the workers had come up to me that came up to work and said that they never knew this type of job existed. It's not only opening doors for tribal members to try something new and to learn something new, but it's opened their eyes to the potential. There's potentials out there that when these guys are done running our lines and installing all this equipment, they would actually be able to go out to another sugar house and say, hey, you know, this is what I know, this is what I can do. And they could work on becoming a professional installer themselves. So there is an opportunity for an individual to be able to go out and find um, 
a nook in the area of their own business. There's not a lot of professional maple line installers out there, and it's hard to find some. So hopefully, you never know, <laughs> one of my workers might decide to branch out on their own and do this type of work. But it was inspiring to hear that as to how much they enjoyed the work. Thank you, Marie. That was a wonderful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. We are going to start um, taking questions right now. We do have a few people that have typed their questions in the question box. If you happen to have a microphone or you were um, you got on to the conference call, you can raise your hand um, and I will be happy to call on you and unmute you so you can ask, um, ask questions. So we're going to start, I'm checking right now for raised hand. So Mia, this first question is for you. The first question is, how many proposals were submitted in 2013 and 2014? Um, good question. Let me. We received uh, sixty-seven applications, um, and funded fifteen this year. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I have uh, Kate Clark who is asking Mia um, if you could provide some more examples of funded agribusiness projects. Um, like I said, they're all on our website and you can read a one or two line description about them. We do fund some agribusiness type projects under SED, so um, that's why I'm looking here to make sure I'm not confusing the two. Uh, so, for example, I think Farm to Table is um, in Guam is doing some, it says they're preserving native Chamorro food traditions while promoting long-term economic sustainability through diversifying business and agricultural practices. They've been doing some uh, teaching their farmers how to do, how to go back into their traditions and, and cultivate farming once again. Um, and once they are producing more of their own traditional foods, doing some value-added um, marketing for some of their products as well. This year we funded um, in Oklahoma, which I didn't even know Oklahoma could produce um, grapes for wine, um, but we funded the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma to establish 52 acres of vineyards, and they're going to actually um, utilize tribal members to establish their own vineyards, uh, as well as the tribe has, uh, they acquired a mansion, and, and, and it's an old uh, vineyard, so they're going to upgrade the, the amount of vineyards that are located where this mansion is, um, and then they're going to utilize their other local tribal members who are farming to produce more grapes, and then the vineyard, once it gets up and established, will will buy their grapes. Um, and this is going to train about 36 people to grow grapes um, and generate their own revenues. So that's another project related to agriculture. OK, wonderful. Thank you very much, Mia. I've got a question for Marie. Um, at one point in your presentation, Marie, you were talking about the isolated nature of um, where the, the maple stand is. Um, Sally um, ha is asking as to whether you have thought about wireless telecommunication. Yes. Um, one of the things that is available to this area, which is new, it's called outreach. Um, which would allow us to um, text each other from um, cell phone, from well, from a cell phone device, so that we can keep in contact, you know, with the town or with somebody. 
The other part we're looking at is the tribe does have a uh, radio tower here and looking at getting the licenses um, agreements in place to be able to put in radios into the work truck, the sugar house, and a basin in town if, um, you know, if we ever needed an emergency. Right now we have an agreement, um, a verbal agreement, that there is a satellite phone available just a short distance away that if we ever needed to, we could use. And that's with a logging company. Wonderful. Thank you, Marie. Uh, we're coming back to you, Mia. What level of buy-in do you need from the tribal leaders in order to apply for a grant? And what kind of support are they expected to provide to you after the grant expires? Um, at time of application, the the tribe should submit um, documentation that they are generally like a resolution that they are in support of and approve of this application, which is going to be located or, or based on um, in their land. Um, so we want to be sure that they're aware of this project in their community um, and that they are supportive of it. And usually uh, with the 20% match contribution, they um, document in that resolution that they are committed to uh, be responsible to provide that match contribution. After the grant, um, there's no requirement. However, we liked knowing that um, the project will be sustained somehow. And um, we feel like these projects have a greater chance of sustainability in that um, if they create new businesses and are able to employ people, that those, that those businesses and jobs will continue beyond grant funding because they're now able to generate enough revenue to, to keep go themselves going without A&A support. Okay, great. Thank you, Mia. I am going to open up Patricia O'Neill's line so she can ask her question. Patricia? Our project is a Living Arts and Culture Center, and um, our marketing um, study is quite promising. Our business plan, we try to scale back uh, to um, start off slow. And because of that, it is, does not turn a profit in the first couple of years. Um, it's relying on tribal you know, donations and other revenue fundraising. So I'm wondering if it's still a candidate for seeds because it is not at a break even. As long as you can demonstrate and achieve the outcomes expected that we identified, uh -huh. um, we do ask for business plans to be provided, but they're not evaluated in terms of the evaluation criteria. Mm -hmm. um, um, but it does help us better understand the project and the concepts and how it's going to move forward. So yeah, that's, and again, that's why we um, decided to make this a five-year project period, because we realized it's, it may take a couple of years um, as Marie indicated, you know, through trial and error, they're kind of learning as they go. And but those 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 um, steps backwards are actually building blocks towards the future because now they're able to move forward in a more confident way and more effective way. Um, so that's it. Because you're not going to be able to break even after a couple of years is not a reason why we wouldn't fund it. But we do mm -hmm. want to be able to determine, you know at the end of the project, how many jobs will be created, how much revenue could potentially be generated, and, um, and that's what's most important to us. We don't okay. set a standard, 10 jobs have to be created, or, you know, we don't, we don't dictate that. You tell us what you're able to achieve. Okay, and that answered my second question, which was, you know, a number of jobs per your investment if you had um, had a criteria for that. And then finally, because a lot of artists and dancers are not full-time employees, um, 
do we have the ability to um, add up, for instance, 21 dancers working for a quarter of a year equals so many FTEs? Would we have that ability to um, aggregate up to full-time equivalents? Uh, yes. There's okay. different ways of calculating that. Um, and as long as you have some methodology and mm -hmm. are consistent with the methodology, um, and then we can probably translate that into how we're um, counting it up to. Okay. And last question is how do you define jobs obtained? Okay. Um, so sometimes the project will actually create jobs that are funded by the grant, you know, such as an executive director or project coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, but perhaps your project will actually train people during as part of the project activities. Mm -hmm. And so because of the training that you were able to provide, uh, you can account that you know, 20 people were able to obtain jobs. Would that count for construction jobs as well? If, the, if your activity is to train them, yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Patricia. Let's go back to some of our written questions. Um, this one is um, for you, Mia. Does the match have to be a cash match, or can it be in kind? It does not have to be a cash match. Um, it can be a combination or it can be all in kind. Uh, we just asked you to document it in writing, how it's going to be calculated and make sure that it, it meets the 20% threshold. And you want to be sure to not exceed the 20% because if you exceed the 20%, you're accountable for beyond 20%. So just do the 20%. <laughs> Great. Can native nonprofits apply, or does a SEEDS project have to be led or managed by a tribe? Um, native nonprofits are eligible for funding. In fact, we have one or two, and they're based in one state, and they're doing projects in other native communities. So, but they in their application presented, you know, letters of um, third party agreements or letters of support and, and from those other communities that they would be um, working in. Um, so that's acceptable. Okay, wonderful. Uh, we have a gentleman who says that he is in the third year of an ANA SEDS grant that it'll end September 30th of 2015. Mm -hmm. Are they eligible to apply for a SEEDS this year? They are eligible to apply um, as long as their grant successfully ends when it's expected to. Um, and then we also need to uh, check the applicant organization to see whether or not they've received consecutive cycles of funding for the same CFDA number. So, for example, if they had two SEDS projects back to back, we would still review their application in the SEEDS competition. Um, but if it is within scoring range and they had had two previous cycles of funding with the same CFDA number, that 93612, we may skip them and not fund them. And the reason we do that is um, because there are other Native communities. Our, our funding is so limited. We are trying to spread as, as much as we have to the various other communities. So the only, yeah, so if, he, if he's only had one SEDS project and is applying again for a SEEDS project and it ends on time um, and it's within scoring range, they could certainly be um, get a new award. Thank you. All right. 
do you have any examples of arts slash cultural businesses that are currently SEEDS grantees? Absolutely. We funded several of them this year. Um, the Guma Guam Unique Merchandise Art um, is doing entrepreneurial indigenous cultural artisan training and, and teaching them how to promote their own artwork uh, through mentoring them and developing business plans for them, um, getting them online. Um, the Capacity Builders Project in New Mexico is doing the same thing, similar um, to that in New Mexico this year. Um, there was a project. Oh, where is that one at? It's in South Dakota. Uh, we're d we have funded several projects that are doing that kind of work. Okay. Promoting artists um, mm -hmm. and, and helping them uh, establish virtual businesses and selling their um, artwork beyond their, you know, those who can actually travel to see it. So it's wonderful. We have a, a tribe that has an existing SEDS grant that's going to end in the fall. And the SEDS grant created the ability for tribal members to learn their carving craft. The next step would be to develop a longhouse that would bring in tourist dollars and provide jobs for the carvers in the longhouse. Mm -hmm. Would it be better, a better fit to apply for SEDS funding for the next step, or does this funding um, does this funding provide for construction? Um, well, okay, I can't answer the question on whether you should go for seeds or seds. I can only uh, encourage you to read each funding opportunity announcement um, and the requirements for each, and determine which is the best fit for your project. In terms of construction, um, no a a grant will really pay for construction. It's a prohibited use of funds. We will pay for what we call minor alteration and renovation. So, for example, um, we just funded the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe this year. Um, they are going to establish a a paleontology um, museum and gift shop. Um, and they have a building where they could house this, um, but they need to, you know, um, put in some shelves, reconfigure some rooms, um, change the flooring, that kind of thing, so that the project will be um, situated in that space. So because it's directly related to the purpose of the project, we do allow expenses up to 25% of the, of the expense for the project. Um, and I believe it's the total cost of the project, or it might be by budget year. Um, but up to 25% for minor alteration and renovation, but no construction. And the definitions for construction, as well as minor um, renovation and alteration, are in the appendices of our FOAs. You've already answered the question about construction. Um, someone is asking whether you can purchase real estate with SEEDS money. No. OK. Um, and we have a question, do honeybees fall under agribusiness? <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> um, you know, some of these things we can't even imagine what we're going to fund until we actually see it, and then we go through it and make sure it's allowable. Um, so, but if you were doing some type of honey venture and you need bees to produce honey, I would imagine it's allowable. Okay, great. 
um, what type of documentation will we need to demonstrate community involvement for a SEEDS grant? Uh, the way we have seen it in applications in the past is uh, folks will have a meeting or a series of meetings with their community and they um, they share with us the minutes of those meetings or they share with us the sign-in sheets and or they will have conducted some type of survey and they've done the analysis of the survey and the proposed project was number one on the survey and this is why they're going forward with it. So uh, there's various ways to do that and we do allow up to 150 pages in the entirety of the application and that excludes any of the required forms, it excludes business plans, and it also excludes your project abstract and the OWP. So that's a lot, that's pretty generous that you can still be able to provide all the requirements we ask for in the um, project narrative as well as additional appendices to demonstrate community involvement and in, in the planning as well as in hopefully in the implementation of your project. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we're coming up two minutes before our, our end period. Um, we want to thank everybody for, for joining. We still have several questions left, so for those of you who do have the time and can, can stay around, we, we would appreciate you doing that, and we'll try to within 15 minutes or so, we'll try to get as many of these questions answered as we can. Um, before anybody leaves, I do want to um, remind you that ANA hosts web, uh, webinars um, every Thursday. Uh, there will not be a webinar next Thursday um, because of the Thanksgiving holiday. So the next um, webinar that we're going to be having will be on December 4th um, and it's on the governmental status of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders and then on December 18th there will be another webinar using census data. Um, this That'll be presented by um, someone from the Census Bureau on how to go online and do research using their databases. Um, all of our webinars are recorded and are available on the Events tab on the ANA webpage. This webinar will be available in about two weeks. We have to make them 508 compliant before they can be linked to the, the website. Um, and again, because of the Christmas holiday, there will not be a webinar um, the week of Christmas. And we will get out to you as soon as we can what our January schedule will be. So for those of you who can't stay, thank you for joining us. For those of you who can, we're going to go back to questions. Okay, um, here's one, Mia. If staff time is used as an in-kind match, is it permissible to use staff time that is paid by federal indirect cost funds? That's really a, a Office of Grants Management kind of question. Um, I, I am not sure. So the IDC includes staff time. Yeah, that's a. That's you a, can you can email me that question and we can send it to the Office of Grants Management for a response if you'd like. Yeah, that's a tricky one because there's a potential if, if the tribe is asking for indirect cost as part of their federal share, there's a chance of, of double dipping. And so Yeah, I hear know. a double dipping yep. opportunity in there too. 
Exactly. Linda, if you can either, you can send that to Mia directly, uh, or you can send that, um, I believe you have my web address or my email address on the invitation that you got for the webinar. If you want to send your question to me, I will forward it on to Mia for you, because I do not have a slide with her contact information. Okay, uh, we are working on a proposal that will generate jobs in the health social service industry, uh, training and employing ho home health care aides to care for elderly and disabled. Would this be a fundable project under SEEDS? We do have a similar project um, that we funded in, oh, where is it? Um, well, the project is in American um, Samoa, uh, but we funded the Office of Samoan Affairs of California. Um, so they are providing a home care provider career ladder program to provide training, education, and sustainable opportunities for 24 um, Pacific Islanders in American Samoa uh, to enter the healthcare field. So yes, it is a project. We have funded similar projects in the past. And it's really great for you as, a, as an applicant to really um, assess what are the market economic market needs in your community. and. Um, like Marie was saying, I mean, they have this resource in their community. They have these trees. They have this land, these maple trees on in in their vast land, and and that's a resource that they are literally now tapping to um, create jobs and generate revenues in their community. So that those are the um, those projects are really exciting and have a great chance of success because you've you've done the assessment. You know what you're community needs, you know exactly what field you're targeting and and you found the need and now you're asking for the project grant to help fill that need. Uh, there is a follow-on to that with those health care um, social service trainees. Can you pay them from the grant during the training period? Some of our projects do allow for um, training stipends. I, we just, I mean, as an applicant uh, or potential recipient, you just want to make sure you have provisions in place that they've signed some kind of agreement to stay committed to the training, um, so that they're not just signing up just so they think it's a quick way to get some money. Um, that's all I would just caution against is maybe have some kind of agreement and, and criteria for how you select your participants um, and include that in the application. Great. Thanks, Mia. Uh, we're going to go and see if um, Daryl Philippe um, has a question. Daryl? It was very interesting listening to the other questions. Uh, I'm from Acoma in New Mexico. And we applied for a seed uh, grant funding, but we're unsuccessful this year. But we were trying, trying to maybe change our course of action, and we were thinking of maybe funding a tarot office. Does, does anybody, do you have an idea what tarot is? And um, if not, I can explain it, which is a tribal. T-E-R-L? Yes, Tribal Rights Office. Uh, and Tribal Employment Rights Office is what the acronym stands for. So my question is, would funding that which provides employment opportunities on the reservation when other outside companies come on and do business on the reservation, would that be a SEDS application or would that be a SEEDS application? Um, it sounds more like a SEDS project. Um, and also, I'm not familiar with that, but I isn't there another federal agency that could fund such an office? Um, not really. No? Actually, they, they do get help a little from the EEOC, which is the federal 
but it's not very much. It's just enough to maybe keep the lights on in the office, but as far as like um, uh, staffing salaries and those type of things, they don't fund those. So I guess because it is related to another federal program, I think you need to really be very specific and articulate how the a and funding might be utilized and fill the void that the other federal program isn't able to fulfill. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. So that we're not, um, so we don't have any questions on our end like, oh, well, they already have this ongoing program, so why do they need the ANA funding? Mm -hmm. So you need to be very careful. Not that it's not allowed, but you really need to articulate how this project will work hand in hand with another ongoing effort, but it's separate mm -hmm. and different. All right, I see what you mean. Yeah, you guys are just talking about it, the double dipping kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And, right, and, we, and we don't want to fund projects that other agencies are already funding, uh, or if it's an a and project that you previously got funded for, you have to say how this project is different from any past funding. I see, okay. Got it. All right, thank you. And again, really pay attention to the FOA in terms of the differences of what the seeds outcomes are going to be and the, and then the um, so the outcomes expected and said are not prescribed or articulated so that's broader and you have a lot of more leverage there versus the seeds it's very specific what we are looking for in terms of outcomes I see okay all right, I think that answers my question. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, um, an ongoing challenge in our community is workforce development and career planning. Often our youth do not have any idea what their next life steps would be. Would a project be considered if our focus is to develop career pathways linked to training and employment? Um, we have funded projects like that in the past, but again, you need to really sort of have a good plan of action on, on perhaps what the market will bear, what economic, I mean, what job opportunities are in your community, that you might be able to fill a niche if you were able to train your youth towards the specific one or two careers. Um, because you're going to have to track these folks um, so that at the end of potentially five years, you know exactly because of the training you provided, uh, you know, X number were able to obtain jobs. Um, what were the salary levels of those jobs? So. You really need to think it all through, but yes, we can do that under seeds. And again, there's some examples of, of projects that we currently fund similar to that. Okay. Um, can you pay to lease building space or land? Um, rent is or lease costs are allowable. Okay, great. Um, can In terms of land, I would just be uh, careful that at the end of the project, you know, who, you know, you, you won't have that land unless you're somehow able to sustain that lease. So, for example, the vineyard project, if, if, if they were leasing that land at the end of the project, then you know, where does the ownership of, of those grapes and the vines and all the improvements on the land, where does that go? Um, because you will have to f report, you know, on any tangible properties or uh, things that, re that you use the funding for. So you need to think that through. All right, great. Um, can facility exhibits, including construction of custom cabinetry, be considered an allowable expense? 
as long as it's minor A and R, and it's related directly related to the project's purpose, I say minor A and R, minor alteration and renovation. And <clears throat> so, for example, with the Paleontology Museum, I can imagine they're going to need some pretty specific storage units that you know are moisture free and have museum quality standards. Um, and so that's directly related to the preservation of their artifacts, which is um, project related. So that is allowable, as long as it's with the, underneath the 25% threshold, which I mentioned. OK, here is another one. Can you use seeds money to build a wastewater plant? Our current one is too small and is stopping our economic growth on tribal land. That sounds like construction to me. Yep. So that would be a no. OK. Um, I understand that you cannot have a SEDS and a SEEDS grant at the same time. Can you submit applications for both? different projects, of course, to maximize your chances of getting one. Yes. OK. And then this will be, well, let me, oh, I think I had one other, um, I have a couple other questions, and then we will be done. Um, could a SEEDS grant support professional development training for existing staff to lead to increased revenue of an education organization? Um, yes. We have a project in Hawaii that is, um, I think it's, taking teacher aides and training them to be teachers and then those with teaching degrees they're teaching them to be um, education administrators the principals um, and that's in an effort to um, increase currently employed people and make them more employable uh, or or help them obtain a higher wage um, and What's great about that program or project is it's, it's putting more native faces as role models in these um, to lead these uh, schools where they have a high Native Amer Native Hawaiian presence. So um, giving the community some additional role models and increasing the um, salaries of people who already have jobs, but with additional training they can get even better jobs. So yes, we do. We have uh, funded projects like that before. OK. And then we have, can seed, seeds funds be used to purchase machinery and manufacturing equipment? We do um, allow equipment purchases. Anything that is greater than $5,000 is considered equipment. Um, and usually when you apply for the, in your application, you really need to submit to us uh, a couple of vendor estimates so we have a, a, a realistic idea of how much that equipment is going to cost. And obviously it has to be related to the proposed project. Um, OK, great. Can a tribe have a language grant and a SEEDS grant at the same time? Yes, those are two different CFDA numbers. We currently, the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe currently has established its own telecommunications company. Um, we are, we have um, thus far um, tested out mobile services, providing mobile service, and um, our broadband, uh, we're about to embark on our broadband project, which is internet in the home plus uh, fixed telephone in the home. And we're short a couple of towers on our to uh, complete our broadband project. And towers usually go for about, oh, 300,000 to 500,000 um, to a couple of our outlying communities that are unserved. We've participated in things like FCC auctions for money. Um, we just uh, 
uh, we're seeking funds from the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm wondering, uh, would the CEAS grant fund uh, tower building? Or if not tower building, how about um, broadband uh, tower equipment? Um, again, I know we can fund equipment. Um, I don't know if that sort of borders on construction. Um, Probably so, it is. It is a construction, yeah. So the construction okay. part would be not allowable, um, but the other equipment, I, I, I don't know. We'd have to take a look at it. And How about um, customer premise equipment? Customer what? Premise equipment, like um, it's kind of like a little box that we put in a person's home so that they can plug in and then they're, um, they can have a Wi-Fi in their home or or they can just plug in one individual computer. Like routers and such? Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would be allowable. You, again, it's, we, <laughs> we have to look at it when we see it and then... Um, yeah, we're currently operating and we've just hired our first installer. We're probably going to need another installer and we absolutely need a um, salesperson. So yeah, so that would be really uh, more in line with our normal requests in terms of we need to, you know, hire people to help grow the business, um, like the positions you just mentioned. Um, and we can certainly pay salaries for that. And because your business is growing over time, those jobs will eventually be self-sustaining. Yeah. So, yes, those, that's the kind of project that awesome. is, is very much um, in line with the FOA. Good, good. Thank you. That's, that, that'll work for me. Okay. Okay, Mia, I do have um, a couple more questions that came in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am walking between SEDS and SEEDS. Our project is strong on non-high school graduate training based on construction that will provide the students a GED and a construction safety certificate. This accomplished will allow some employment and allow, some em um, allow for further trade training. Where do you think we would have the best opportunity, SEDS or SEEDS? Uh, I can't advise. Uh, there's no, like I said earlier, prohibition against applying for both competitions. Um, it's just that when you apply for SEEDS, you have to um, be very specific about those outcomes expected. Um, so, is, is you, like I said, if you're going to create jobs, employ people, train people so that they can get a job, create a business venture, um, then that's really what SEEDS is all about. Um, I think you might want to contact um, the IPE Nation of Santa Isabel. Uh, they're in California. We, they are starting a construction business with this year's uh, SEEDS grant that they received. Um, but then we also have the Penobscot Nation, which was funded under SED several years ago, which did a, a construction training and employment project. But that, so you could go either way. Um, I'm located on the Bakken oil play. We need tribal workforce development desperately. We are looking at developing a workforce development program for the petroleum industry occurring here in western North Dakota. Would this qualify for seeds? Yes, potentially. You need to identify who's going to do the training. Is the training available locally? Um, and um, you have a really strong, so it sounds like you've already identified a, a need, an economic development need in your community. You have people, so now you just need a, a way to provide training to those people. Um, and hopefully you have qualified and credentialed training available for you as well. So just make sure all that's documented in your application. 
Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much, Mia and Marie. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I want to thank our audience. Um, please check your TNTA providers' websites. Um, all of us are scheduling different pre-application trainings um, that we provide to walk you through the process of putting together um, an a and &A grant application. Um, in addition to the training, um, we can also provide electronic technical assistance and actually review your grant application before it is submitted to a and &A, um, to hopefully help you focus your application a little bit better and address the evaluation criteria. So keep that in mind as you're planning your projects. As Mia said earlier, um, they are hoping for the funding opportunity announcements to come out in um, a couple more weeks. So time is getting short and it's never too soon to start planning your projects and gathering that community documentation. So I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, the webinar will be available um, on the ANA website in a couple of weeks. Have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again to our presenters.